Welcome to another episode of Thinking Like a Bank, where we show you how to think like a bank by applying the same strategies and principles that banks use to help you find more financial freedom in your life. I'm your host, Sarah Ibrahim. Today, I'm interviewing Trisha Talbot. She advises physician owners and investors with opportunities in the healthcare real estate asset class. Her track record in investment sales Landlord representation, corporate representation, and tenant representation offers clients trusted experience with comprehensive strategies with pricing, market fluctuations, and problem-solving solutions that result in successful transactions. Trisha, welcome to our podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to get to know you and to interview you. Um, I know we we talked briefly before recording about uh, briefly about real estate uh, for healthcare. Um, the healthcare organ- industry. Before we jump into that, I want to know more about you and 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 your background. So I um, started in commercial real estate about 22 years ago at a medical office developer, and did their in-house leasing. And then I moved to a third-party uh, boutique firm. Uh, they were local here in Phoenix, Arizona and worked a third party brokerage, which means I did leasing sales, um, <clears throat> both landlord and tenant leasing at, at the developers. It was just an in-house landlord rep um, leasing that I did. So I expanded on my career that way. I went to a national firm for um, a few years and uh, really focused solely on investment sales. And then uh, in 2020, uh, started my own firm and transferred over in 2021 to doing, you know, hundred percent, um, just my, my own brokerage firm and then started uh, an investment side where, um, I sponsor investments in medical office buildings. Got it. And how was that experience of starting your own brokerage firm? <laughs> uh, now it's great. Um, obviously, um, you know, starting your own business, there's just too many things to think about. And even as organized as I was, there was always something new for about the first year. Um, I ended my day with just trying to catch my breath because, you know, at the same time, you're still transacting and, and then also doing the operation side. So right. um, that's mellowed out now. And I, I absolutely love it. I, um, it, it's great. Right, because a lot of I think a lot of real estate agents they they're typically part of like larger national groups, right? And they get their like training and support through them. But in this case, you started your own brokerage. So did you have agents like working under you? So what was happened? So I went to a national firm for th- their platform um, for investment sales. And in the commercial real estate world, for those that may or may not know, there's there's food groups, and you have to sort of specialize in a food group because it's um, kind of impossible to do all of them. I know that there's people that do, but um, you have office, industrial, uh, apartments, and land and retail. So those are the food groups, and so. Healthcare real estate, mm-hmm. um, you know, it doesn't get its own food group. Um, it goes underneath office. And the only thing that is tough there is that, you know, the support for that as far as, you know, uh, marketing and research in particular, it it's you can't just lump it under office. It requires its own research and, um, you know, it has a little bit of a different it needs it needs a different marketing twist because you're not you're not marketing to uh, just general office. You're you're marketing to healthcare um, organizations and or landlords that specialize in investing in this asset class. And so it really does take its own research. And um, so I found that I was doing a lot of that. So I was, you know, in a, I was doing a lot of, a, a lot of the legwork and, um, you know, and I, I had a client base that I supported and, um, you know, I've always wanted to own and run my own business. So it just sort of came to the point where I was like, you know what, this is probably the best thing to do. And then, you know, I, I do plan to grow and, and hire mm-hmm. some agents as that um, requires. Um, and, you know, right now I'm training a transaction manager to kind of take over the day-to-day of that. Mm-hmm. So I, I 
intentionally, you know, started my own firm because I really wanted to specialize just in healthcare real estate. And I wanted to be able to uh, provide the research available, the resources for my clients. You know, when they're making decisions, they need a little bit different uh, demographic information. They also need to know, you know, where the closest hospital is, how big is it, uh, who does that hospital serve, what insurance companies are serving that area. You know, there's a lot of different, a little bit different aspects that go into making a decision when you are either a practice looking to expand in a market or you're an investor of medical office buildings looking to purchase an asset in a market. So I wanted to be able to provide that to them. Um, and so th that was, that's one of the, the main instigators for me starting my own firm. Right. And, and you're right. I think it's like it's too big to lump under offices because if it's a law firm, for example, that's under office, and then to put healthcare under the same organization, mm -hmm. uh, under the same category, um, it's a little bit tricky because healthcare is going to require probably more, more space, more equipment, uh, probably location for patients to come and go and for other stakeholders. So I, I get that it's 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 probably not going to be the same entirely. It's not going to be the same thing to lump under office. But so can you kind of give us an example of a client reaching out to you? How does the process work? Like, what are you asking? What are you, what are the clients asking? Kind of guide us through like an example of working, of, of someone working with you. Well, to go to your, to the point of where, you know, your, your target market, you know, they're, they're investors. So it all, it, it all stems from the underwriting. So when you are a practice looking for office, medical office space, you know, there's a, one, you want to be strategically located, you know, dentists and some community medicine, they can, they can be located out in the community, you know, you know, visibility, they, you know, they want to be visible and easy to get to. But, um, you know, if you're a specialist, you tend to want to be not necessarily on campus, but you definitely want to be around the hospital campus or in a medical village, you know, complex per se, or where people are tend to go for their medical care, you know, it just, it's, it makes sense. Um, you also need to, if you're going to lease space, you know, you have to know the landlords that are medical office, you know, you'll in every city, I mean, there are medical tenants in office buildings, and they've made it work. And, you know, how those deals were structured in those times, you know, it, it depends, but typically medical office landlords, they underwrite their properties to offer tenant improvements. And, you know, medical building functions a little bit differently where, you know, these tenant improvements, a landlord helps fund a tenant improvement a package for a new medical tenant, because to your point, medical tenants require um, a higher specialization of space. So, you know, it's, it's really hard to retrofit a family office, a former family office space into a law firm, like you said, or vice versa to take a law firm to yeah. now every, it, you can do it absolutely a hundred percent. It just costs money. But, um, you know, the, the plumbing is a big, a big issue. Um, if you, you know, dentists have gases, um, if you right. do procedures, you know, there's certain, there are certain requirements in the space that are specialized and they they tend to cost a lot of money to build out. So in return, what these tenants offer these landlords is longer term and they typically have a, a higher lease rate than general office. And that accounts for um, the landlord helping to fund and finance those tenant improvements on the leasing side. So that's a huge difference between a medical office asset and a general office asset. And typically, um, so so on the provider side, that's how I advise them. If they're um, if they're an investor and they're looking to get into the medical office asset class, you know, I, I definitely qualify if they have done it before. And if they haven't, I help them understand some of maybe the things they don't know that they don't know. Because if they are, you know, a lot of people will go to a cocktail party and they've, you know, owned retail forever. And someone's like, oh, you have to get into medical office now. But, you know, medical office is a lot different than retail and retail, the, the landlord doesn't fund as much um, tenant improvements, you know, the lease rates are still high because of the visibility, um, but, you know, but the fundamentals are, are different in underwriting that asset class from a medical office. And if you get into it without knowing that or planning for that, then, you know, you just learn the hard way, and have usually you... expensive way. <laughs> <laughs> right. Have, have, you, have you seen a lot of like, um, 
like how how have things been different since COVID, but specifically in, in your niche? So this is an asset class that's kind of, um, you know, it, nothing's recession proof, but it definitely is recession resistant. So, um, you know, like right now, office is kind of figuring out or, you know, there's a flight to quality. So the nicest buildings are getting tenants. Um, but you're seeing, you know, people are decreasing their footprints in general office to account for, you know, the hybrid work that force that is ha happening as a result of the pandemic. Um, you know, retail went through it with the Amazon effect, you know, industrials doing great, you know, good, you know, uh, last mile industrial and apartments have been, you know, doing well for a while. Medical office, you know, it, it definitely doesn't get like the huge spikes, I would say, but it, it stays nice and steady. And um, because practices and healthcare companies, they have to have a place to examine patients. So, you know, telemedicine has come up um, and it comes up in a lot of conversations like is telemedicine going to take over? And it's, it's not, you know, it's going to add value. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it adds a lot of great value for a lot of people. But if a physician needs to examine you or you need to have a procedure surgery, I mean, a great example, I mean, you cannot do those things um, remotely over, you know, telephonically. I mean, the, the patient has to be in a facility, even if there are some, um, I think in urology, they're doing a lot of, there's some remote um, instruments to, to allow for some procedures, but the patient is still in a facility because if that patient codes or needs, you know, um, higher tr uh, level treatment, you know, it's in a facility that can offer that. So, so it's not going to, I think outpatient medical care too, with just the cost of healthcare. Um, you know, I think right now the statistic is that 50% of um, patients get treated or fifty percent of uh, healthcare is in a hospital, and fifty percent is outpatient. So, um, I just think with the cost of healthcare, you know, getting it out of the hospital, if it, unless it's trauma or critical care, and into an outpatient facility, as well as you know, they're always needing to be a facility to treat a patient, um, is keeps the medical office strong. Right, and which areas you see like are probably like the dominant geographic areas, like the better geographic areas across the country for, for this particular niche, or is there even such a thing? Yeah. I mean, people have been investing in the Sun Belt for a, a long time, you know, just, I think migration, the, the migration patterns are following that. Um, but, you know, with different economic climates and market cycles, you know, different geographic areas are attractive. I mean, I see a lot of activity going on in the East coast right now. Um, and, you know, that I think might just be market, there, there might just be some really good um, deals available. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in the Sun Belt, though, is where I think a lot of companies tend to try to focus their investments, just because, you know, if you have to focus on something and target your more bang for the buck, that's where they're focusing on. And and those are measured by like the new sales. Is that what makes it like uh what changes the I think it's the growing demographic. So I okay. mean healthcare has to serve people and wherever the population is or growing, you know, that obviously the healthcare services are gonna need to be there to to treat people. I mean, you see even in the most rural places, there's a dentist and a family yeah. practice. Uh, you know, I mean, so so people need healthcare in a lot of different geographic areas. So obviously if it's growing, then, you know, there's going to be expanded healthcare services. Right. And does, does your work also entail like nursing homes, long-term care facilities, short-term care facilities? So the medical office asset class, healthcare real estate does, I, I don't tend to focus on those, but the healthcare real estate um, ecosystem does include those. Yes. Right. Cause I could imagine an increase in that particular sub niche or niche because of the, because everyday people are aging. 10,000 mm -hmm. people every day are turning 65. So I could see an increase for the need for long-term care and assisted living facilities. Right. Yeah, assisted living, growing up assisted living has been, um, I think for the past 20 years, people have been gearing up for, you know, the aging population. And I think also, um, you know, people have, I mean, not necessarily with this current generation, but our generation for sure, you know, we've been gearing up for not being able to rely on, you know, Medicare necessarily. Right. And so um, people are saving for retirement and, you know, there obviously there's different levels of assisted care for different economic um, segments mm -hmm. and the people that want to, 
you know, they, they may need that assisted care, but they want to go in a place that, that they, you know, can afford and is comfortable for them and, you know, based on their lifestyle. I mean, that made that definitely, that definitely makes sense from the standpoint of, and I don't know if you can answer this, but from the standpoint of like rate of return, um, how do you compare it? For example, if I'm an investor, I come to you, I'm like, hey, Trisha, I want to buy, for example, a medical office uh, building. I want my intention is to lease it over the next 10 years to either one or multiple tenants. Um, what could I expect from like an average standpoint as far as rate of return or um, ROI? Well, I think it's like in many other ones, you know, I think everyone tries to target about 16% IRR. Yep. Um, it obviously greatly depends on a lot of factors right. that, you know, go into it. I mean, the, the what you pay for it, uh, what rents you lease, what, you know, can lease it at, um, and, you know, what capital improvements you need, you know, how much capital you put in for tenant improvements. So, you know, all of those factors obviously affect the return. So, you, you know, depending, I would say, if you have a return in mind, then you buy a property that can allow you to get that return instead mm -hmm. of trying to assume that every property is going to allow right. you to achieve that. That's, a, that's just an impossible um, way to do it. But if you have a, a return in mind, because also you can get the higher returns if you take on more risk and it's successful. So if you take on, like if you buy a property that doesn't need any leasing, no capital improvements, and you're just collecting rent, you're gonna pay a lot for that. So the return is gonna be less, but mm -hmm. the, the risk is also gonna be less. Now, if you take on a property that's 50% lease, 60% lease, 70% leased, and you know, you're know you able to lease up that last 30%, your return is gonna likely be higher. And are the what percentage of these properties that, that you've worked on are like triple net lease? Uh, so mo I would say I haven't seen a new medical building that's anything other than triple net. There's some legacy medical buildings that don't have, that are not separately metered for electricity that um, are still modified gross. But those are even, if, if there's a new landlord that really wants to put everybody on triple net, you know, there's a way to do like even right. demons and separate everything. But, um, and that's because different medical uses use different amounts of power. So, you know, if an imaging center is in a building and it's not triple net, then the other tenants end up having to pay really right. high electricity bills. And that's just, you know, that's not incredibly fair. Right. So I think in order to be fair, and some have different hours as well. So I think the way to solve that is landlords are like, look, it's triple net. And then, you know, you pay for your own electricity so usage and a janitorial because every medical practice, you know, medical practices, they, um, I mean, there's probably a janitorial company that a landlord can recommend that does maybe like the common area or many of the other ones. But, you know, if a medical practice has a certain level of cleaning and they have a, a vendor that they prefer it's just easier for them to be able to use that instead of trying to make them use the landlord's choice right definitely and then from this yeah from the standpoint of like the investor it's i guess it's there's more certainty right when it's a triple net lease because you know exactly how much you're you know exactly how much you're protected from inflationary costs of expenses i mean everything is just passed through to the tenant Got it. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. So just to kind of uh, summarize, if somebody's looking to invest in a medical office, they can they can reach out to you and then you can help Absolutely. them in that process. Mm -hmm. You could you could do everything mm -hmm. remotely, like they don't have to meet with you in person. Yeah, no, they can we can do I do Zoom calls a probably 50 percent right, more actually now, um, even yeah. in town, just because people don't have the time or yeah. the desire to drive. <laughs> and so, um, I mean, eventually we meet in person, but if if people want to do, you know, they, they like to meet, you know, uh, quickly and, and yeah. just, you know, want to do a meet and greet. So we meet over Zoom. I like to see a person's face, um, you know, and have us at least meet over Zoom. I think that's a more friendly way of doing, I mean, these are not small transactions. These are big transactions so you know i think it's important for us to have a face to a name and kind of know each other's personality and and then kind of go from there i really work at how my clients want to work you know yeah. if they never want to meet in person that's fine um most everything can be done through docusign yeah. and then you know so we just sort of move forward i i, I move it however they want to do it right i'd be out of business without docusign so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a, there's, and uh, yeah, and it's, it's great. I mean, it's, it's, um, it solves a lot of problems. Right. 
Um, before we go, I do have one question. So how how has lending been recently, like over the last year in, <laughs> in your field? I, so it's gotten obviously like you know it, everyone's experiencing that it's gotten tighter. Obviously, I mean it's much more expensive. Um, I think that. Um, you know, people are just going to have to, I, I think, make some changes where they thought that they were going to buy a property at a certain price. They're going to have to, um, you know, either one, buy a less expensive property or, you know, right now there's a pull. And in Phoenix, you know, we experienced 9% inflation. So, you know, we haven't had an issue. It's gone down now, but we were probably one of the top, like, highest inflationary markets. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Right now, you know, here especially, and, and everyone, you know, cap rates and interest rates, while they, they are not 100% correlated, right. um, you know, the cap rates have not moved up, especially in this market. I know in other markets they have, but I think, you know, cap rates are going to have to move up to account for the risk that, the, that everyone's having to absorb with the increased cost of capital. Um, and when that happens, I think more transactions will occur right now. There's a bit of push and pull. I mean, you can still get some good deals, but you got to look really hard for them. And then, you know, everyone's just gotten used to having super low cap rates in, in the healthcare right. real estate asset class. And, um, you know, either they, you know, they don't like having to move up to higher cap rates and obviously less value for their property. Yeah, that, that that definitely makes sense. And then when when you're working with like, for example, the investors, do you have like one lender you work with, or do you refer them to like a, a loan broker who has multiple? Um, I options? never have just one. Yeah, I never just have one. I mean, I can refer them to some depending on right. the price point of the property and you know what they're looking for. A lot of them have preferred lenders. Um, either they come in because they have banking relationships, which you know, if you, as you know, when you get a loan someplace, they typically ask you to also open up a checking account and right. deposit some funds. So, um, so I think you know they come in with some of with with those relationships. But you know, right now, I think people are shopping, and there's mortgage brokers out there that will shop for them. And then you know, there's some different lenders. Right, because I could ima I could imagine the lending is a little bit tricky. It's not like buying a house, like a residential property, like where you go to like a a, a, co a conventional bank. There's probably a little bit more niche to it, like to especially when the when the values are like in the millions. It's probably going to be most likely harder to find um a loan plus a higher usually a higher down payment, right? Well, I mean, the down payment is just a function of a percentage. I mean, if you take 75, 25 of right. a multi million dollar property, it's just going to be higher. So yeah, yeah, you have to come in with more money um, and sometimes the loan to value, depending on how the bank underwrites the property, you know, they, they could, I think in healthcare, I, you know, they're, they're still doing 70, 20, 75, 25, right. but, you know, depending on the borrower's credit or track record, you know, they, that could push up um, mm -hmm. higher. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it's a dollar, it's a higher dollar property. So it's, right. it's, more money in other words if, if it's another type of commercial property it's still going to be 25 percent usually so um same percentage as commercial as other as yeah other it just it, it depends yeah i think it depends a, t a ton on the property type i think it depends a lot on the track record of um of, of who's borrowing the money to right right that that makes sense so so trisha it was a pleasure interviewing you and having you on our podcast how can Thank you. listeners connect with you and learn more about you Absolutely. So um, they can email me at, at T Talbot, T T A L B O T, at docproperties.com. That's the best way to get a hold of me. Um, they could go to the, my website, which is docproperties.com. My phone number, the phone number to the office is on there. Uh, but if they want to schedule a meeting with me, the best way is to email me. They're welcome to call me, but what happens then is we tend to play phone tag and that gets people frustrated. So I usually encourage people just to email me and say, Hey, I want to meet with you. I have a link that I can, a scheduling link I can send out. And that's, that seems to be a smoother process for everybody. Okay. Sounds good. I'll be sure to add in all the links you mentioned in the show notes below. And I'm looking forward to having you back on the podcast. Oh, I look, I look forward to it as well. Thank you. Thanks. To learn more about what we do and how we can help you grow more wealth, please visit www.finassetprotection.com. That's F-I-N, assetprotection.com. 
The topics presented in this podcast are for general information only and not for the purposes of providing legal, accounting, or investment advice. On such matters, please consult a professional who knows your specific situation.